I want to talk about bond ETFs. And we, how many times have we addressed this in the last two months? But money keeps coming into bond ETFs, particularly corporate bond ETFs, guys. And it's not just because the government is buying some corporate bond ETFs. Uh, I noted, uh, Todd, last week, Bloomberg noting first-time buyers of uh, BlackRock's iShares ETFs added 10 billion of inflows in the first half of 2020. That's not all, of course, government uh, money that's coming in here. And they're getting bigger, uh, uh, Todd, and, and with good reason. Why, why is money keep going into these funds, despite the fact that we're dealing with essentially very, very low returns, particularly, of well, course, well, on the yields? We noted in a, a separate piece outside of that one that insurance companies in particular were increasingly using fixed income ETFs like LQD, among the other products. And they were actually buying in early March ahead of the Federal Reserve. It's not that they were market timing it. It's just they saw the benefits of liquidity, of price transparency. We saw bond mutual funds have relatively stale net asset values, whereas the ETFs were more real time in nature. You get diversification benefits, you get cash management benefits, and that's the institutional side of it. It trickles down towards the traditional retail investor who has tighter spreads, uh, benefits from the scale as the costs keep coming down. Fixed income ETFs are about half of the overall net inflows in 2020, despite being 20% of the overall ETF pie. They continue to punch above their weight, and I think that's really among the major stories of 2020 in, in ETF land. Yeah, yeah. And, and Chris, I, I think the I, I think the, the key point here, Chris, I want to get your reaction to, to this point. I, I think the, the institutional buy, buyers realize how efficiently the ETF market has been pricing corporate bonds. You know, there used to be some debate about who's right when you get a difference between the prices and the net of the and the net asset values. And they would say, oh, well, these things are going to blow up because, you know, they're not going to be able to price them because the underlying bonds don't price very uh, accurately or quickly. It turned out, you know, it was the ETFs that were right. And, and don't you think institutional buyers have, have noticed that fact? I, I do. I think, I, I, look, I think, again, ETFs have held up really well in the, in the fixed income space, despite, you know, criticisms about uh, transparency on pricing of the underlying bonds. Um, however, you know, like you said, they have held up. And I think that the, there is, you mentioned yield, while the yields are low and we're seeing these inflows, there is still a need to own, you know, fixed income, whether it's high yield or whether it's investment grade. And people are still searching for yield. Now, right now, you know, there is sort of a it feels like the market might be on a little bit of a hold in terms of whether spreads are going to continue to compress a little bit to get to those traditional levels in high yield and investment grade or whether or not as we as we ease into this year, into the back half of the year, the spreads might widen out again with that sort of press uh, preset there. You might want to start thinking about yeah. where you're going to watch this fixed income asset growth uh, go. Is it going to move from investment grade to high yield, high yield to investment grade, or are people going to reduce volatility in those sectors? Well, we know what's going to happen here. If the market keeps going up and the volatility stays down, they'll migrate towards high yield. I mean, that's been the story that everybody's just desperately uh, going towards uh, higher risk, uh, high yield funds.